Welcome back everyone to a slightly different portfolio update. I did something uh, very satisfying and I dumped 10,000 pounds into this crazy ass stock market. And I think I owe an explanation as to why I dumped it in right now, especially during this economic uncertainty that we have heading into 2023. We stunned if we don't have a recession in 23. Don't know the timing, but certainly by the end of 23, I will not be surprised if it's not larger than the so-called average garden variety. And I don't rule out, not my forecast, but I don't rule out something really bad. Why? Because if you look at the liquidity situation that has driven this, um, we're gonna go from all this QE to QT, we're following an asset bubble, um, we've been doing all this uh, running down on the SBR, which is now, that's the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. It's now below 84 levels, even though obviously oil consumption is much higher. Um, we've had a bunch of myopic policies that have actually delayed the liquidity shrinkage. QT has been almost entirely offset by Janet Yellen running down the Treasury savings account. By the way, Pretty amazing policy. She could have sold 10 years for under 1% during this time. Instead, she runs down the Treasury savings account. So all that has mass liquidity shrinkage, but it really comes into full gear. And she can continue this for a while. We can do the SPR for a while, stimulative stuff. But by the first quarter of 23, it kind of goes the other way. So our central case is a hard landing by the end of 23. But I don't know. the. I've been wrong on a lot of things. I could be wrong on this, but since I do it for a living, that's our forecast, which is a recession in 23. So a recession in 2023 is definitely on the cards. That video makes my stomach churn every single time I watch it. So they're always something to worry about. And the key organ in your body in the stock market is your stomach. It's not the brain. Drucker Miller is a bit of a hero of mine. And to see him sitting on stage telling the world that he thinks that everyone is going to lose money Th that's scary not only that but i'm dumping money into the market and i think we're going to have a recession <coughs> who wants recession <coughs> there's lots of economic explosions going on and the only reason why we think that it might not is because day-to-day -day, average people are not losing their jobs yet <coughs> What's worse is that history is very clear that it does not price in a recession. And Jim Reed, macro strategist at our bank, wrote that historically, the S&P 500 normally always, normally always, okay, let's forget he said that. Historically, the S&P 500 normally always only bottoms out in a recession and usually not until midway through. Many influential investors believe that this 25% drop in the market is all pricing in the possibility of a recession in 2023. The 50% drop in Tesla, the 90% drop in SPACs is all priced in because investors are scared that a recession is coming. Historical evidence does show that a lot of the time, the market does kind of start to price in a recession. But it's only until midway through these crashes when we actually have the recession announced that we see a bottom. That means if there is a recession called in the next year, it's very likely that we will see the S&P 500 leg down even further. And of course, the most important one for us, because this is an asset bubble like we had in 2020 and 2021. The recession was only called halfway. We had 30% drops all the way through. And after the recession was called halfway through the big drop in 2000, it was only a year later that we actually saw a bottom. So this is very important for me to consider when I'm investing into the market. Another thing that makes my stomach churn. <laughs> So why the hell did I do this? 
Okay, we've got 58127, that's 10,168 pounds to add through the Trady 212 pie feature. I'm gonna add 10,000 pounds, and this is what Trady 212 thinks I should add by the target weighting that I've decided to put in into my income pie. You notice how it's all quite even there. But if I set it by self-balancing, Trading 212 works out exactly how much money I should be putting into my pie to make it more even based on my targets. Uh, so some of the stocks are down, some of the stocks are up. And I've got a lot going in. I've got 3,000 there going into Brookfield. I've got uh, 70, little 70 going into Tritax. And uh, quite a bit there going into ASML. Probably shouldn't be doing that, but I'm, I'm okay with it. ASML, I'm in for the long term. So we click confirm buy and it informs me that some of these stocks aren't going to be bought today because I'm buying them out of hours. You click OK and the money is automatically sent to trade 212. And ah. Trust me though, that was really satisfying. It was really cathartic. To put it simply, I've accepted that I cannot control the macroeconomic environment. I cannot control or predict what's going to happen with interest rates in the future. So I just need to keep buying. The 50s was the best decade, the century of the stock market. And people wouldn't buy stocks in the 50s because they're worried about nuclear war and they're worried about recent depression. Then people, <coughs> remember when oil went from four to 40 and it was gonna to go to 100 and we're gonna have a depression, remember that one? Well, about three years later, the same experts, now higher paid, oil's now at 10, and they said it was going to go to four, and we're going to have a depression. It always ends, and we're going to have a depression. Or the Great Depression, we're going to have the Great Depression. I never could quite understand that adjective in front of depression, but the, uh, or the Great Depression, or the big one, the big one's coming. All I can do is invest based on my personal financial situation, which is why I had to sell a few of my stocks a couple of months ago. If you need to use the money anytime soon, you should not invest in stocks. This is money you're willing to put in the market and leave it there for 5, 10, 20, 30 years. That's the kind of money you're going to do well with. If you're worried about it, don't invest it. And I should base my current investment thesis on the businesses that I'm investing in. Not what the world can do to these businesses, but how well these businesses are doing and how strong the story is for producing that future cash flow. However, there are two ways that you can look at this graph. While we see these deep, deep recessions and these deep drops in the stock market, a recession is defined as a temporary slowdown in the macroeconomic environment. That means that the stock market, while it does have these huge drops, it does tend to recover. So I am continuing to invest and in that investment today, I bought quite a lot of stuff. I was going to buy Alexander Real Estate, but I decided against it at this point. I don't think the story is there for me for Alexander Real Estate. So I decided to sell the tiny bit of stock that I had in that one. I brought Amazon 261, JP Morgan Chase got a bit, KLA got quite a bit. I think that's a bit too much to put into KLA at this point, but I still did it. I also made the same mistake with ASML. Digital Realty Trust, I did want to buy. I think that is undervalued at this point, but you will notice here that I've added two new additions to my portfolio in Brookfield Renewable Partners and Blackstone. Blackstone is an alternative asset manager, a bit like Scottish Mortgage Trust, loads of other things, and they invest in all sorts of things like real estate all over the world. It made headlines recently because it limited the withdrawals on one of its main funds called BREIT. This is a real estate investment trust. A lot of private real estate is within that market and it did very, very well in the past two years. Investors within this fund want to take a few gains from this and maybe invest their money into somewhere a little bit safer considering what's gonna happen in 2023. This was taken by some media outlets as a weakness for Blackstone and a sign that they were in trouble. We set up BREIT six years ago with the goal of delivering great performance to individual investors in private real estate led by our world-class franchise. And that is exactly what's happened. We've delivered 13% net to our customers over that period, three times the public read index. We've done it because we've had the right portfolio positioning, 70% in the Sunbelt states, which are growing really rapidly, 
80% in logistics and rental housing, the fastest growing sectors in real estate. We would have been in a much different position if we had bought office buildings or enclosed shopping malls. And 90% of the debt we fixed for six and a half years, the last couple of years, as we got concerns about rising inflation and interest rates. We also set up the product with limitations on liquidity. We described it as semi-liquid because we knew at some point there would be periods of volatility and we didn't want to have to sell assets at the wrong time under pressure. While yes, it is a little bit troubling that people wanted to pull out of their BREIT REIT, Blackstone has automatic limitations of 2% on this fund because it's a real estate trust. They can't get to the assets that are invested in that quickly. You can't just sell a building out of nowhere and just give the money back to all the shareholders. So BREIT has to put these limitations when people are getting out in a market downturn. It's a sign that investors are wanting to move out of this fund, but it's not a sign that they're in trouble. Blackstone have had a 42% loss in the last year, but they're an A-plus credit rated company with a 50% debt to capital. But what really drew me to Blackstone was this cash pile of dry powder of $181.9 billion. That's more cash on hand than Berkshire Hathaway. Earnings projections haven't been revised yet, but I do like that this company has now come back down to its five-year average PE or price to AFO ratio. If it remains at a price to AFO ratio of 13, we can see an 11.9% total return over the next three to four years. That's not bad and I like that valuation. All that cash, great credit rating and a little bit undervalued. One of the risks here is that Blackstone doesn't have a very long dividend growth ratio. It only started paying a dividend in 2016 and since then it has been a little bit fluctuating. It does go down or it's projected to go down when cash flows aren't as great it does still need to keep that liquidity up. I have no problem with this though, because it would be a decision that needs to be made based on the amount of liquidity that this company needs. And my second big purchase, and it is a big purchase for me, 3,212 pounds has gone to Brookfield Renewable Partners. Another big dividend yielding stock, Blackstone was about 6.13% in dividend yield and Brookfield Renewable Partners is 4.71. I've done another write-up on Brookfield, so I won't be going into Brookfield too deeply at this point, but essentially Brookfield Renewable Partners is another asset manager. It's another asset buyer, but mainly in the renewable sector. I'm a big believer in the renewable sector. I think that's where the world's energy production is going. I don't think it's going to destroy oil or anything like that. I'm not thinking that, but I do think there is renewable energy production on the increase in the next couple of years. And in the next 10 to 20 years, it will be a huge part of our energy production. Cash flows within this company are very high. I think it's got a 4 billion dry powder on it. It's a triple B plus rated company. I'm really bullish on this company and I think it's way below its average PE. It's currently sitting at a price to free cash flow of 9.23 and it usually trades at 15. If the world gets bullish on renewable energy again, which I really do think it will over the next five years, you've got a potential 33.6% annual year on year return. Not a huge possibility of loss because it's within the whole Brookfield partners, the Brookfield asset management company. It can draw on money from that side as well, because I think Brookfield Asset Management, BAM tech symbol, owns about 60% of this company. So it is in Brookfield Asset Management's interest to keep this company alive if it does ever go bad. It's not anywhere near that. It's producing great cash flows and increasing cash flows year on year. And while I wait for this capital appreciation to recur on Brookfield, I will be getting a 4.64% dividend yield. Okay, so my portfolio value right now stands at 58,260. I've got 753 pounds blocked for pending orders on Legal in General, Tritex Big Box, and Seagro. So that money will be used to buy those when the market opens in the morning. And we are getting very close, 0.18% away from going green again. That's unrealized gains, but of course, my entire portfolio is actually 12% up based on the deposits that I make. 
my holdings in the pie currently alphabet is my top holding with nearly 5,000 in value 4,800 I've never seen uh, one of my stocks be valued at that much I'm not going to be investing in alphabet for the seal future I really want to get the dividend yield of this portfolio up ASML and KLA two top semiconductors that are at the top of my pie all weighted here at nine percent next microsoft is weighted in there and i'm 2.92 percent down on microsoft right now legal in general sits there in sixth place and the new one brookfield renewable has made it into sixth place there so that's my portfolio we're 0.21 percent down right now 57.322 invested and a total portfolio value of 58.243 thanks very much for watching guys and we'll see you on the next update Okay. <laughs>